Chick-fil-A's meteoric rise is scaring the crap out of their competitors. While other restaurants have seen customer satisfaction fall in recent years, for Chick-fil-A, their customers seem to love them more than ever. So what's behind their meteoric rise? How have they come from relative obscurity to become the fastest growing fast food chain in the US? Well, that's not an easy question to answer. Behind Chick-fil-A's incredible story, there are plenty of reasons why their success should never have been possible. From the way they treat their employees to their unorthodox mixing of business and religion, this is a fast food chain that stirred up controversy time and time again. Despite having one of the largest and most vocal group of haters, they've still managed to become a beloved restaurant chain with some very passionate fans. It's time to investigate one of the most mystifying cases in the history of fast food. This is the remarkable story of Chick-fil-A. How did a chicken sandwich take over America? That's the question I first set out to investigate, and it led me to a little diner called Dwarf House, run by two brothers, Truett and Ben Cathy. I started here because this tiny diner laid the foundation for today's Chick-fil-A. You see, from the very start, the brothers prioritised customer service. Their aim was to treat each customer like they were the most important person in the world, and they closed on Sunday out of respect for the Lord's Day. As Truett put it, quote, For us, family, business and church weren't separate aspects of our life. They all blended in together. That blending would cause serious problems for Truett later on. But in the beginning, no one really seemed to mind. Hungry workers from the next door Ford auto plant poured into the diner and the brothers had to alternate 12 hour shifts just to keep up with the demand. For the next two decades, the Dwarf House was moderately successful, but as the name implies, it was unusually small for a diner. So how did this small statured restaurant grow into a nationwide success story? To truly build a cult following, you need something special. For Truett, it was his chicken sandwich. Lightly breaded chicken, two pickles and a buttered bun. Customers at the Dwarf House went crazy for it, and seeing that popularity was enough to convince Truett that A, he needed a new, bigger location, and B, he should cut out all other menu items and focus just on the chicken. To communicate that focus to his customers, he came up with a new name, Chick Filet, a play on chicken filet. But despite the new name, Truett still needed a better location for his restaurants. And here's where another vital ingredient in their success comes into play, shopping malls. You see, the indoor shopping mall was a relatively new phenomenon at the time. It was only about a decade earlier, in 1956, that the first one had opened in Minnesota. As more and more malls started opening across the country throughout the 60s, Truett spotted an opportunity. He was one of the first restaurateurs to recognise and capitalise on the fact that shopping mall food courts were high traffic areas with great foot flow and a hungry captive clientele. In his eyes, that made them the perfect place to sell his mouth-watering chicken sandwich. As the popularity of malls grew throughout the 1970s, Chick-fil-A grew right along with it. Pretty soon, Chick-fil-A had spread throughout the South. But here's another interesting thing about Truett, and arguably one of the secrets to his success. Truett never focused on expansion. He always believed, above all, in creating a high quality experience for the customer. If you could achieve that, he said, growth would naturally follow. So Truett set out to create what, on the face of it, might sound like an oxymoron, a fast food chain where quality is valued above everything else. The way that Truett went about achieving that goal is perhaps the most fascinating and the most controversial part of this whole investigation. So Chick-fil-A doesn't just let anyone run their locations. 
its acceptance rate for new operators is just 0.15%. That makes it over 30 times harder to get into than Harvard. Even the interview process can take over a year. In just one example of how difficult it can be for prospective operators, one former US Army Ranger had to write 12 essays and go through 10 interviews over the course of a year and a half before he was accepted. That incredibly rigorous application process is how Chick-fil-A has created, as some call it, an army of Truett clones. By weeding out anyone who's not 110% committed to the company's vision, Truett really has found the next best thing to cloning himself. But with this ultra-selective process also comes a dark side. Before I get to the controversies, let's touch upon why so many people want to open Chick-fil-A stores. Today, the average Chick-fil-A restaurant generates about $8 million in sales a year. Compare that to McDonald's, where the average store sales are much lower, around $2.7 million a year. And while the owner of a McDonald's store can expect to earn around $150,000 a year, a store owner at Chick-fil-A takes home about $200,000 a year. Keep in mind, startup costs are also much lower at Chick-fil-A than most other national fast food chains. To open a Chick-fil-A location costs just $10,000. Compare that to McDonald's, where it takes between one to two million dollars to start up your own franchise. When all of that is taken into consideration, plus the fact that Chick-fil-A sales have grown an amazing 54% in the last five years alone, during which period McDonald's growth has been sluggish at best, well, then it becomes clear why so many operators would rather open a Chick-fil-A store compared to a McDonald's one, especially when they can expect Sundays off. The question is, who gets to become an operator? This is where the interview process has drawn some criticism. First, there's the fact that the interview can be pretty invasive. Candidates are likely to be asked about their marital status, number of dependents, and even their involvement in church and social organizations. In some cases, a candidate's spouse and children are also interviewed. Why? Well, Truett's view is, quote, if a man can't manage his own life, he can't manage a business. He's also said that he'd probably fire an operator who, quote, has been sinful or done something harmful to their family members. Now, the company makes it clear that operators don't have to be Christian, but they do have to, quote, share Christian values and be, quote, willing to participate in group prayers during training and management meetings. Each candidate is told to play an active role in your church and that Chick-fil-A's owners are devout Christians and expect all of their operators to share Christian values. With all that in mind, it becomes pretty clear that for Chick-fil-A, the perfect operator is a married Christian who's active in their church and community. If you're wondering how Chick-fil-A can get away with that, with what many would class as discrimination, well, it's because franchisees aren't technically employees. They're independent contractors, with Chick-fil-A claiming that they see them as partners rather than staff. So what about the staff? Well, it shouldn't come as a surprise to hear that many Chick-fil-A employees have accused the company of discrimination. In one case, a Muslim employee was fired the day after refusing to join fellow employees in a prayer to Jesus Christ. That case was settled out of court. Then there was a case of the female manager who was fired so that, according to her employer, she could be a stay-at-home mother. More recently, a transgender woman, after suffering repeated racist and demeaning comments from a co-worker, reported the sexual harassment to the location's owner, to which he allegedly replied that she should take it as a compliment that someone was attracted to her. For many Chick-fil-A critics, this last incident is just one more reason to hate a company that they see as having always been anti-LGBTQ. More than anything, it's the company's stance on gay marriage that has really drawn their anger. So 2012 was the year that it all exploded. In an interview, Truett Cathy's son, Dan, 
who by then was the president of the company, responded to a question about gay marriage by saying, I think we're inviting God's judgment on our nation when we shake our fist at him and say, you know, we know better than you as to what constitutes a marriage. This caused an uproar amongst LGBTQ activists and their supporters. As a way of protesting, many people organized kiss-ins at Chick-fil-A locations across the country. There were also calls to boycott the restaurant. The conservative former Arkansas governor, Mike Huckabee, then entered the fray, calling for a Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day as a way of countering the kiss-ins. Suddenly, Chick-fil-A found themselves in the middle of an escalating culture war. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. It turns out that even before Dan Caffey's comments about gay marriage, Chick-fil-A had already been a target of the LGBTQ community and their supporters. That's because over the years, Chick-fil-A has given to several groups considered to be anti-gay, including one group that encourages conversion therapy, a harmful practice that involves trying to cure someone of their homosexuality. Now, after CEO Dan's controversial comments, the Chick-fil-A PR department kicked into full gear. They apologised, said they'd stay out of the policy debate and cut ties with some of the anti-LGBTQ organisations that they'd been giving to. The thing is, to many critics, Chick-fil-A still remains a strong symbol of anti-LGBTQ sentiment and for that reason, many refuse to ever eat there again. Now, after weathering such an intense backlash, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this would have an impact on sales. Amazingly, the opposite has happened. If ever you need proof that any publicity is good publicity, look no further than 2012 and the fact that the year of the kissings saw Chick-fil-A sales increase by a record 12%. That same year, they also opened 96 new stores more than in the previous year. And now, their growth seems unstoppable. The truth is, even the largest fast food restaurant in the world, McDonald's, seems to be looking over their shoulder. In 2019, a board representing thousands of McDonald's franchisees begged McDonald's to come up with a chicken sandwich that could compete with Chick-fil-A's. Imitation may be the highest form of flattery, but it in this case, you can't help noting more than a little fear. And look, I don't blame them. McDonald's may be ahead of Chick-fil-A in terms of sales, but only because they have far more locations. In the US, McDonald's has over 13,000 locations, while Chick-fil-A has just 2,704. It's not hard to imagine a world in which, with a few thousand more locations, Chick-fil-A could conceivably become the number one fast food chain in America. America. From the very beginning, Truett Cathy prioritised his personal and Christian values over company growth. Today, decades later, you'd be hard pressed to say that it didn't work for him. Chick-fil-A may have legions of critics, but they're clearly on the rise and they show no signs of slowing down. From a tiny diner to the third largest fast food chain in America, Chick-fil-A's growth has been truly remarkable and they've done it all without working a single Sunday.